So, and the camera's on, by the way. So, while we're setting this up, I want you to know that we're finishing up Unit 10 this week. Now, Friday is Good Friday, so there's going to be no school on Friday. That would have been the test day. But we have an AP test coming up. So, in order to stay on schedule, what I'm going to do is on um, Andrew and Kennedy, I want you to hear this also. On Wednesday this week, I'm going to hand out the test. It's going to be a take-home test. And here's, here's the boundaries for the take-home test. It's going to be open note, um, open book. And if you want to talk about it with other people or do internet research or whatever you can, I'm, I'm not going to put boundaries on communication. What my hope is that through discussing with other people and studying your notes, that you'll actually be able to learn about you know what's going on as you're taking the test. But the test is not going to be due Monday after Easter. It's going to be due the Tuesday after Easter. And whoever is watching this video, you just see my mouth move. I'm um, probably hearing things too. Surprise, <laughs> <laughs> you're the bearer of good news. <laughs> anyway, but the point is that I don't want it to be due the Monday because then you have to do homework on Good Friday and Easter, you know. It's, so I, it'll be, you'll have from Wednesday, when I, at the end of class Wednesday, until the following Tuesday to complete the take home test on Unit 10. So, uh, do you have any questions as to what the expectations will be for the Unit 10 take home test? Alrighty, so yeah, I hope that at no point you get involved in mindless copying of stuff that, you know, if you're not sure of how to do any of these problems, you'll be like, oh, let's, can you help me understand this? Or my, my purpose in this is that you'll uh, be able to learn through the process of understanding how to do all the problems on the unit 10 test. Okay, well, we need to carry on then, so we're going to move on to the next Handout, which I believe is actually comparing means part two of three. I've got the handout for you on this. So I'm going to pause the camera while I hand this out. We're going to comparing means part two of three. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are looking at comparing means part one of three. And it'll be a good idea for you to take out your AB80 sheets because this is row four. So please take out row four of the AB80 sheets. And comparing means means basically looking at what is the difference, the true difference between mu1 and mu2, the difference of means. That's got to be the fourth row. So A, B, 80, blank and filled in. Here we go. Let's uh, take a look at row four. And I'm going to zoom in on this. The, uh, the conditions here off on the far left are the independence assumption, randomization condition, or a representative sample, and then the normal population assumption is established by checking the normal, the nearly normal condition twice, once for each sample. And the sample has to be drawn from two groups, which are independent of each other. So the independent groups assumption has got to be established, and there's not an official condition for this. You just have to write a statement about whether it's reasonable, whether or not it's reasonable to go out on a limb and make the independent groups assumption. So if you were to go to your calculator and go step test zero, then your calculator would say, hey, you're about to make a, you're about to construct a two sample T interval for a difference of means. And so basically, this is a trap for the difference of means. And so instead of observing just one mean, what we open our eyes and look at is the difference of the means between the two samples. Instead of p1 hat minus p2 hat, it's x1 bar minus x2 bar. That's going to be the middle of the trap. Now T star, this is one of, one of the places in the course 
where T star sub degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom formula here, that's T star sub DF. The degrees of freedom, just make a note to yourself, the degrees of freedom come from technology. There's a really complicated formula that the authors of our book discuss in chapter 24. That's what row four is all about, chapter 24 of our book. And they, they toy with the reader. They say, oh, you know, are, are you sorry you asked about what the formula is? And they actually put the formula for the degrees of freedom here in the footnotes. And they say, oh, you're probably sorry that you looked down here. It's, it's a crazy complicated formula. So that's why I know it's hard to read here because of the resolution, but you actually have to say, you have to declare what the degrees of freedom are, but they come from technology. From technology. So your calculator, when you do a stat test zero, it will tell you the degrees of freedom so that you don't have to use any sorts of crazy formulas. All you have to do is say, you know, the degrees of freedom are 207.315 from technology. That's the only thing you have to do is say it came from technology. The standard deviation, yogurt day, we add the variances. So it's sample standard deviation one squared over N1 plus sample standard deviation two squared over N2. So, that is uh, the blueprints. Those are the blueprints for building the difference of means trap. Now, if instead of a two sample t interval, if we go stat test four, it's going to be a two sample t test. So, in row four, two sample t test with a difference of means. The hypothesized difference will be zero, the observed difference will be whatever it is you observe. And it's the same standard deviation formula down there. So with that, you should have row four filled in on the A, B, 80 sheet. Why do we have to put minus zero? Well, it's to maintain parallel construction with all of the other test statistics. All of the test statistics are observed value minus hypothesized value. So it's just underscoring the fact that we, our null hypothesis will always be that the difference of the means will be zero. And let's see, is that what happened up on, yep, sure enough, we, we did that up here too. Okay. The difference in the proportions is hypothesized to be zero. So it's refreshing to see that there is parallel construction here. Follow-up questions on that row. So, yes, go ahead. So, what is the difference between IA and IGA? Independence IGA. assumption. IA stands for independence assumption. IGA stands for independent groups assumption. So, here we are checking the independent assumption. So, we're not actually checking the group. Yeah. That's are you talking about the IGA? So when, when we are talking about the condition. The condition. So what we should do, we check both. Yeah, so for IGA, there is not a condition that you check for independent groups assumption. So the reason that there's nothing there, and in case, just for those of you watching at home, Frodo is pointing out, and this is a curious fact, that on all the other assumptions, there was some sort of condition that we actually check in order to justify making the assumption. But not so here. And the reason for that is, um, that all we have to do is think. We have to write a statement that indicates that we've thought about whether or not it's reasonable. Now, are these groups from which we're taking these two samples, x1 bar and x2 bar, are they independent of each other? So there's no official named condition. We just have to think about it and write down our thoughts. So you'll see it in the example how that plays out. So now we can actually switch to the handout. And I have uh, something here to share with you. Yay. It's apparently a statement. And oh, so we watched, oh yeah, because we've all already watched that clip from Life or Something Like It, right? Uh, About Prophet Jack? Yes. Uh -huh. Correct answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently there was one year when today was the day when I showed the Prophet Jack clip, and here's the interpretation. Of that, the probability is one in a gajillion that we observe all three predictions made by Prophet Jack Number Two, Seahawks 119, 13, the LCL, 
the meteorology is pretty sunny. And earthquake in San Francisco, 98.6. And your natural sampling variation alone in samples of the same size, given that prompt jack, is crazy. And so that's, that's what we did then. But today, since we already had that, we can jump right into the new scripts. And so, for example, um, the wording here is going to be a little bit different. Suppose that we build a trap, a 90% confidence interval for the difference in mean household income between two school districts, District 125 and District 112. And what if the confidence interval for the difference in mean household income is 8,000 to 15,000? How would we interpret that? Well, I think you actually, it's not even a fill in the blank thing. You actually have it stated there. It would be a box interpretation based on the sample. I'm 90% confident that the household incomes of District 112 are between 8,000 and 15,000 less on average than the household incomes in District 125. So, warning, warning, you have to look at the order in which the subtraction occurs. If District 125, that's actually the Stevenson High School District, minus District 112 comes out to be positive numbers, then we're saying that District 112 is between 8,000 and 15,000 more than District 125. How would the wording on this have to change if this were District 125 and that were District 112 in the interpretation? What what other words would have to change if I changed those two numbers around? Andrew? Less would go to more. Yeah, I'd have to change less on average to more on average. So I'm just letting you know up front, pay careful attention to the order in which the subtraction occurs here, because that's going to affect your wording, whether you use more than or less than. Now, if one of them is a negative number and one of them is a positive number, that's also going to affect wording. But I just want you to have a record of that. Also, uh, the $100 question, how do we interpret this? Well, what, what do we mean by 90% confidence? In repeat sample, about 90% of intervals constructed from samples of size 40 will contain the true amount by which average household income in District 125 exceeds average household income in District 112. So most of this interpretation we're familiar with, but there are some subtle differences that I want you to see there. Let's go to the next page. Page two. Oh, um, oh by the way. Yes. So there are five types of traps that we build in AP stats. By the way, AP stats is easy in case you haven't heard of AP stats. Uh, so we build P traps and mu traps. So the difference of two proportions, that's called the capital D trap, because think about it. P traps. I mean, we've been using Greek letters for you know, mu trap for the parameter. Well, you know why we can't use a Greek letter for a P trap? It's because the Greek letter for P is pi. And pi is already reserved in mathematics for the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. So we have to depart from the tradition of using. Greek letters for parameters, English letters for statistics, which approximate parameters. So, likewise, a difference of proportions, um, we end up having to make the same departure here for P1 minus P2, we call it a difference D. Today's trap that we're building, there is a Greek letter for the difference here call it a delta trap. So what we're building today is, you could call it a delta trap, but that's not something you'll be tested on in the AP test. That's just, just so you know. Um, AB 80, 56, 24, CD, donate your car today, 8, 2. The 8, 2 part, that's going to be coming up. That's a difference of means. So I, I just want to tell you right now, probably the hardest part of the take-home test 
will be distinguishing between the concept of a difference of means and a mean of differences. Row four of the AB80 sheets is all about the difference between two means. It's about a delta trend. Mu sub d is the mean of the differences. That's what we look at when we're doing blocks of size 2, or pairing things up. So that's going to be a separate concept. A separate row of the AB80 sheet is when we look at means of differences, where we take a person and say, put waterproofing formula type 1 on one boot, waterproofing formula type 2 on the other boot, you're paired together because both of your legs are on the same body. And then we're going to take the difference in the number of ounces that leak through the two boots. We're going to take the mean of those differences. The mean of the differences. So when we're talking about, I mean, obviously they're not independent of each other. The independent groups assumption would not work. No, they're not independent. They're, both measurements are from the same person. They're just two different feet, two different boots on the same person. So notice they don't, they're not going to have, it's good, going to be, it's going to be paired data. It's when you're actually violating independent groups, you're actually pairing things together. That's when you would talk about the mean of the differences. So this is going to be the waterproof boot example. This is the mathematics of how to actually conduct a test on waterproof boots. It's where you pair two things together, take the difference in how those two waterproofing formulas performed, and then take the average difference. Mean of differences is not the same thing as difference of means. Oh my goodness, people get confused on that left and right. Can you imagine? Because they sound so similar to each other. Difference of means is not the same thing as the mean of the differences. But this is chapter 24. This is today's chapter. And then before you leave for... Easter, you're going to have to also learn the, the meaning of the differences. So this is chapter 24, 25, and 26. I'm sorry, 23, 24, 25. And the test that's due on Tuesday, take-home test Tuesday, covers these three chapters. 23, 24, and 25. Frodo. So just a quick guess. So the difference of means, you should be two things. And the mean of difference should be one. Yeah, yeah, it's a one sample T interval for the mean of the differences. Also just called the paired T interval. So, yeah, you're only taking one sample here, but you're sampling differences. Each person who's wearing these two boots contributes a difference. So, that's just an overview of this chapter. It's all about means. Means, difference of means, mean of differences. Okay, now let's go into the actual examples. Today we're looking at mean of, uh, difference of means, not mean of differences. When I say go, I'd like all of you to say out loud and in unison. Chapter 24 is about the difference of means. Chapter 25 is about the mean of differences. Ready? Go. Chapter 24 is about difference of means. Chapter 25 is about the mean of the differences. Okay, so yes. Yeah, go ahead. So, let's take a look at our first example. In difference of means. So, problem one, dogs and calories. In July 2007, Consumer Reports examined the calorie content of two kinds of hot dogs. Meat, usually a mixture of pork, turkey, and chicken, and... <laughs> All beef. Let's not talk about what the actual ingredients in all beef are. So my, my, my daughter's informed me of what's actually going on there, and then, and then she went vegan. So the researchers purchased samples of several different brands. The meat hot dogs, two independent groups, by the way. There's, you know, unlike waterproof boot on the right, waterproof boot on the left, this is like just two independent categories. You've got that, those meat hot dogs, and then you've got an independent group. This is the beef hot dogs. Okay, so calories on average, so they're giving us X bar one, and then 
So although it probably we would probably go x dog meat and I mean x bar meat and <laughs> x dog x bar meat and x bar b is how we would think of those. Okay, tested the null hypothesis that there's no difference between the mean calorie counts that yields a p value of 0.124. So would a 95% confidence interval include zero, or would it contain zero? Okay, so let's go through the routine. This is, uh, we, we have to know whether it's one tail or two tail. So class, when you're looking at this, does this look like, by the way, um, let's say delta equals zero, but we're saying that mu one, mean meat minus mu beef equals zero. That's the null hypothesis. Do you think the alternate hypothesis would be greater than zero, less than zero, or does not equal to zero? Based on the verbiage that you see, greater than, less than, or does not equal? Does not equal. Yeah, it does not equal. It's just that they're different, so it does not equal zero. But, um, yeah, p-value came out to 0.124. So anyway, this is two-tail. Because it does not equal to zero, it's a two-tail test. And therefore, we have a very straightforward conversion formula. The confidence level is just going to be 1 minus alpha. And we're talking about 95% confidence interval. Therefore, what's the alpha level that was that is going to be used in this situation for the 0.124 dancer. Go ahead and call out if you know what the alpha level had to have been. Or the alpha level that matches up with the 95% confidence here. 0.05. 0 0.05 is correct. It's just 1 minus 0.95 is 0.05. So, um, based on that, I'd like you to put either yes or no in this blank. It's going to be a yes or a no situation. So this is a two-tail. It is two-tail. That's right. How do you know if it's two-tail? Well, there's no verbiage that indicates we care more about the difference being greater than zero or the difference being less than zero. Okay. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. In fact, that evidence is in this verbiage right here. Just the hypothesis, just the hypothesis that there's no difference. Well, it's just the absence of language that would point you to either greater than or less than. So, we're, hopefully, your reasoning was that uh, since 0.124 is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject, and fail to reject corresponds with contain, or a synonym for that is include. So, the answer is yes. The 95% confidence interval would contain zero. The high p-value means that we lack evidence of differences, so zero is a possible value for the differences. I mean, that's one way to explain it, but we've been through that routine quite a bit. Let's go to number three, dogs and fat. The Consumer Reports article described in exercise one also listed the fat content in grams for samples of beef and meat hot dogs, the resulting 90% confidence interval came out to be negative 6.5 to negative 1.4. Okay, so now we're reducing our confidence from 95 down to 90, which means the interval is shrinking down. Less confidence means um, less precision. And notice that both teeth are negative. So zero is no longer included. The endpoints of this confidence interval are negative numbers. What does that indicate? Well, it means that that now the mean fat content is probably higher for beef than hot dogs, but we're only 90% confident that the mean fat content is higher for meat than for beef. Meat minus beef came out negative. That only happens when the first number in the subtraction is bigger than the second number in the subtraction. So that's the kind of logic you have to go through. How are negative numbers produced? It's when you take a bigger number minus a smaller number. And then finally, 
or in part B, what does the fact that the confidence level interval does not contain zero indicate? It indicates that the difference is significant. If we use a confidence interval to test this hypothesis, what's the corresponding alpha level? Well, again, it's two tails, so it does not equal two. It's just one minus 0.9 is 10%. So that's a little bit of review of some of the basics there. Let's go to page three. Please join me on page three. And dogs and fat, second helping. In exercise three, we saw a 90% confidence interval. And explain what you think each of the following statements is true or false. So it's always fun to do true or false statements. And I'm going to pause the camera while you try to knock those out true or false on your own. You may begin. 